Okay, hi everyone. This is the 40 Method 40 User Group. Uh, today is December 14th, 2022. It's the last meeting of the year. So early happy holidays and happy new year to everyone. This is meeting number 62 for your uh, for your future reference there. Um, on the agenda today, it'll be a quick one. Uh, just talk a little bit about 40 Method, do a, a happy hour review from Kirk Brooks. Get a little 4D news from Jim Sobchak and uh, uh, some of the, uh, we'll cover some of the recent uh, great tech notes from the knowledge base. Uh, Ad Common Trends, or he will be, uh, will be handling the, uh, the knowledge base updates for us. And then we'll uh, kick over to our special topic today, six changes to check before transitioning to project mode. Uh, from uh, Eric Louis, um, some great uh, great tips there for uh, for anyone who is uh, ready to make the leap to uh, project mode from their their classic mode uh, older application. So, and then we'll talk about the next meeting on February first. Um, my name is Brent Raymond. I organize the Forty Method Forty User Group. Uh, our website can be found at fortymethod.com. And you can reach out to, uh, to me at 40method at gmail.com. What we try to do with this user group is, uh, is just to bring together all of you uh, uh, developers and users of 4D out there in the world. Uh, all of our meetings are held over Zoom, so you don't have to, uh, have to worry about uh, making a long drive or fly into Chicago, where I am. <laughs> in the US anyways, um, uh, all of the meetings, previous meetings for going on 10 years or more than 10 years, whatever it is, uh, they're all recorded and available in our YouTube channel. Just look up 40 method uh, on in, in the YouTube. And um, we're just here to try to provide a fresh new channel, uh, new new way uh, to uh, to share content and uh, get exposure for all of you developers and users of 4D out there, and um, and just you know discuss what we're working on and show off a few things and uh, even uh, share some components and that sort of thing. Um, and I invite all of you to uh, share what you're working on. Be a presenter for the group. Um, we've got a few dates open next year: February, March, and May. Um, if these do dates don't work uh, exactly to your schedule, well, we can change our schedule to to meet yours. Um, just uh, you know, we're always looking for interesting topics and materials. So please reach out to me, and um, and we'll see if we can uh, get you penciled in. Uh, our schedule is at 40method.com/schedule, and a lot of other things, good things on the blog as well. Um. Yeah, so we're going to have a quick, a very quick meet. whoa, very quick meeting today. <laughs> In fact, it's going to, it's, it's over now. <laughs> no, <laughs> joking, but uh, um, uh, obviously, uh, some of you may be aware that there is a, uh, a soccer game today, football, uh, depending on where you're coming from. Uh, France is playing Morocco. Uh, I'm sure no one is talking about that in 4D, uh, the company uh, who, uh, of course, originates from France and has uh, many a an employee in Morocco as well. Uh, I wish both of you um, happy times and success. <laughs> Not picking sides. Uh, so far, both of you have done a great job. So, um, but yeah, we'll so we'll try and uh, get get through the uh, the meeting as quickly as possible today. So we can all settle in and watch. Uh, so now I'm going to hand it over to Kirk Brooks, who organizes the the 40 Happy Hour, and talk a little bit about the Happy Hour and what's uh, what's been discussed very recently uh, in the past few weeks. Hi, Brent, and uh, thank you, thank you yeah. for uh, giving me an opportunity to say hello to folks. If you haven't uh, heard of ha 40 Happy Hour, or if you've uh, never stopped in, it's uh, every Friday afternoon at 3.30 uh, Pacific Standard Time. Uh, have a little, um, uh, I have the Zoom link down here. 
And um, uh, there's also at uh, 40happyhour.com is a, a, a modest little website I put together that uh, reminds you of the link. And uh, this is an opportunity. It's a, a, a weekly users meeting that um, gives you the opportunity to come in and uh, just talk about pretty much anything having to do in the 4D world. And uh, sometimes things a little peripheral to that that uh, you might want to talk about. Uh, for example, last Friday, Aparajita Fishman stopped in and uh, spent some time demoing his uh, new ideas about uh, error handling that he's in, uh, going to have incorporated into his uh, uh, much anticipated component that uh, is going to be released here shortly. And uh, we don't always have such luminaries as Aparajita there. In fact, frequently it's uh, just whoever comes in and has something that you want to talk about, you want to share something, you want to ask about something, uh, you just want to uh, just want to get with some people who know 4D and and uh, see what we're doing with it and um, enjoy um, sharing with each other. Interestingly enough, just you know, just sometimes just looking at how somebody else's desktop is set up um, spurs a lot of good discussion. Uh, it should, just gives you ideas about how to do things. It's uh, pretty rare, actually, that somebody, even those of us who have been there a long time, just don't look at something somebody else does and say, wow, I never thought about that before. So I invite you all, please come. Uh, beginners, uh, experienced people, it doesn't matter. That's about it. Thank you, Brent. Thanks, Kurt. Yep, it's a great casual way to um, to, 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 to talk to other developers and, and whatnot. Uh, you know, Apparagita showed a little try-catch uh, uh, functionality that he's been working on. Um, great sneak peek of that. So anyways, uh, uh, hope to see you all at the happy hour. Um, and next, we'll hand it over to Jim Sobchak uh, at uh, 4D for a little bit of what's going on here at the end of the year for 4D. Yeah, thank you, Brent. And I'll try to keep my, my little spiel short as well. Um, yeah, everyone, there's a lot of interest in the soccer match, as you can imagine. Um, there's not a rift between 40 Morocco and 40 France at all. Everyone's just pulling. You know, we're, we're, it's a win-win situation for us, right? So um, it's pretty amazing to have them in the semifinal together. That's good to hear. Yeah. 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 But Morocco does go crazy when they win. So <laughs> be careful. <laughs> we want everyone to be safe out there. Okay, um, yeah, thank you, Brent, for inviting Ad and Eric and myself to participate in the meeting today. Um, these are always fun for us. We're really looking forward to Eric's presentation as well as you are. Um, I don't know if, I think most people here may have run across Eric somewhere along the, the line of 4D, but he's really one of our shining stars at 4D on the technical support team and on the professional services team. Um, in addition to all this, uh, tech support duties. He he helps on professional services projects. He leads projects. He writes tech nodes. So um, from everything from helping developers convert to project mode to converting to V19. So I'm sure it's going to be an interesting presentation. And also, please pay attention to ads, uh, two tech notes that he'll be highlighting today, one of, one of which he wrote. Um, but they're also very interesting topics um, that I, I'm sure you'll appreciate. So here at 4D, um, I, I wanted to thank everybody and uh, for bearing with us while our phones were out for uh, quite a while. We had some, uh, uh, one of our PBX servers went down and we chose that time and it was like the data was corrupted. We decided at that time, we were thinking of going to a new phone system anyway. So we've now converted everything up and running. We're super happy with the new phone system. Um, as an FYI, we moved to Zoom phones um, because we use Zoom meetings all the time. It's really easy. It's a transparent um, transition from Zoom phones to if you want to jump into a meeting. So we're really happy with the service we're getting from them and the quality of, of the calls and everything. So thank you all so much for bearing with us during those um, almost two weeks of, of phone outage. I know how frustrating that is when you're trying to get a hold of somebody on the phone and you can't. So. Uh, thanks for that. As far as business goes, yeah, we're wrapping up um, a big year for 4D. This is um, financially going to be the best year ever for 4D in the U.S., um, and it really isn't close to other years. Um, last year was 
an outstanding year for us and we're um, having a really good year this year, not only in the US, but all the subsidiaries. So we have a good chance of having globally the best number we've ever had. Um, but in the US, um, almost certainly we will have that. So thank you all as developers and uh, business owners for putting your uh, trust and confidence in 4D products and services. We really appreciate um, you working with us. Uh, the sales team will be busy through the end of the year. We're renewing um, partnerships now for 2023. And we're almost through that. We're, we're right at the same number we had last year. So we lost a couple, we gained a few. So um, a good year for us. We're still, we still have the Amazon gift promo um, available till the end of the year. And in short, that is if you buy version 19 products with maintenance, you're entitled to Amazon gift codes um, going from $30 to all the way up to $600, depending on the size of your order. Uh, we do this every year and there are many people who wait until we do this to order. So we're having another successful run with this promo. So you still have about two and a half weeks left to take advantage of that. Um, marketing events, training. Um, I know several of you on this call went to JPR's training. Uh, thank you for attending um, and for your feedback in that, both the October sessions and the November sessions. So we hope you appreciated that. Um, we thought JPR was in a fine fettle, so to speak, for the trainings. And it's always a pleasure to listen to him and uh, get his insight into uh, where we're going with the 4D product line and how to use it. So um, he's still doing his thing and he's, he's an amazing guy. So uh, that's about it. But um, last thing before I go, I wanted to put on my 40 Christmas hat and uh, wish you all a, uh, a Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and, um, and we'll be talking soon. Thank you, Brent, for this year of meetings. Um, it's been really a treat for us to participate. So thank you all. Happy Holidays. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. And, uh, you know, great hat there. Wow. That's, uh, <laughs> they, they've, uh, they've stopped doing the baseball caps, I guess, huh? <laughs> uh, we had to order some more of those. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I remember, uh, those, uh, from a few years back, but, um, but yeah, no, thanks. Thank you guys for, uh, all of your participation, everybody's participation, especially, uh, everyone at 4D, uh, throughout this year and past years for uh, helping to make these user group meetings possible. Um, as Jim mentioned, uh, they just wrapped up the uh, the training with JPR. Uh, always a few interesting tidbits in there and a lot to, to digest, especially uh, information about uh, what's coming, how, how 4D is progressing, uh, you know, how, how we should be what direction we should be developing in uh, in order to take best advantage of uh, of 4D's new feature set coming coming up and around the corner with V20. Um, and uh, there's always a couple of interesting uh, acrobatics in, in his demos. Uh, I found this one to be very interesting. This is a a, a a show of how you can create a sort of a a, a grid a list box grid of subforms uh, using a dynamic dy you know, dynamic forms stored in JSON where you can uh, combine them into uh, uh, one larger form and uh, and have it be a sort of a grid that you can select uh, select different. Uh, different sections where you know and, and it's not only um it's not like your your old-fashioned list form it's uh you know you can put whatever you want in each of these subforms buttons and check boxes and fields to enter and whatnot so it was interesting interesting uh um strategy for creating that sort of an interface which uh, yeah it's always neat to uh, see how how to do different uh approaches Anyways, um, uh, now I'm going to hand it over to Ed uh, for a little uh, 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 talk about a couple of the recent tech notes that uh, came out in the knowledge base uh, recently. Ed? All right. Thanks, Brent. Hi, everybody. Um, so there are two tech notes that we are just recently released um, towards the end of November. Um, 
Now, before I get into that, I just want to keep reminding you guys, I know I'm, I do this every time, but I want to make sure that I keep saying it until um, I see um, you guys are starting to download the tech notes um, uh, from our knowledge base. So the tech notes is um, uh, something that we worked really hard and tried to make sure that um, you guys get new content, especially um, some of the implementation that we offer, um, you know, not only teach you how to use some features in 4D, but um, give you a practical use case for those features. And those are always our focus for introducing or create, uh, producing a tech note for you. So, um, you know, um, it's always available. Um, if you are Port 40 partners, definitely they are available immediately for you. Um, if you are not, um, again, that's part of uh, being a, a part of um, uh, partner program benefits is uh, be able to get the latest contents. Now, if you are not, um, you know, you have to wait for a little bit longer for uh, the tech notes will become uh, public and it usually lasts for uh, 12 months, okay? Um, just uh, on that note, let me get back to the topic of our latest tech notes. So the, the first one on the screen right there, that's a dynamic print selection using 40 Write Pro. Now this is, um, the tech note that is kind of inspired by um, just a few of the 4D write pro commands that allow us to bind a context of the data into part of your document or the whole document. Um, the implementation not only um, you know, describes some of those basic features, but give you a, a workable API that allows you to build uh, a print selection. Uh, most of us do print selection all the time, um, especially um, in business application. Um, you know, this the idea is not to focus on creating a static print form uh, form that you have to do just one task, but um, focusing on uh, dealing with data definition, which allows you to be a much more dynamic. You can create. Um, your own data definition and save it as a template and reload it and call the commands um, that offer in this tech node. Um, there are three main uh, API in there. It's super simple to use um, the way that uh, it, the implementation was written uh, is basically allowing you to just drop these three commands in any parts of your application, put in your own data definition and you'll be able to print um, um, your data uh, in different format. Um, if you can see, um, when you go to the knowledge base, you have a, a, a better um, a screenshots uh, where it shows the different type of layouts, including break levels as well. So have a look. Uh, hopefully that can be used in many of your application uh, and your projects. The second tech note um, is, again, this is sort of a, a revision of uh, an implementation that was released many years ago uh, by, I believe, Angelo Caprizi. Um, he uh, was able to create a web monitoring um, sort of uh, comparable to the admin server window that you will see on the server machine. Now, the reason behind this tech um, component was to give anyone who wants to deploy a headless server or running your application as a service where you don't have access to your UI uh, to be able to monitor what's happening um, with your application. And the monitoring obviously is done through a web browser. Now this component along with the new uh, feature in 4D that allows your component to run its own web server uh, is definitely a, a big plus, right? For example, if you have an application that's already running your own web server. This component has its own web server running on its own port. Um, you know, it's not interfering with your existing web server that's running from the host, which is really nice. Um, the, one of the things that you can have to have is um, the, the web server license, and that is the only requirement. As always, uh, many of our implementation in the techno it comes with the source code. This is not a closed component. It means that you can even enhance, um, add your own stuff in there if you um, very, um, uh, you know, uh, you want something more. You can recompile it um, and do any kind of stuff that you want. Um, so yeah, definitely, this is something that um, is going to be very helpful for many of your um, deployments. Okay, 
So um, that's it for me uh, for this month. Um, and hopefully uh, we'll have something uh, else by towards the end of the year and uh, beginning of next year. Thanks, question. Ed. Uh, yeah, Tim question. had a quick question. Yeah. Um, to use this, um, this component to uh, monitor 40 server, do you need a web server license? Yes, you do. Uh, so that's a, a bit of a, a bit of an expense just to monitor it over the web over over a, a web connection. Yeah, that's kind of a part of the. Uh, I understand um, now. You sure sure would be sure would be nice if 4D is uh, going to build a headless server that there was a way to monitor it through a web interface without having to pay an extra thousand plus dollars for a web license. That's true. Um, feature request, just feature request. That's right, all. right. But think of this as an open uh, implementation, right? That's why it's not a built-in feature in 4D. This is sort of some, uh, an implementation that, um, you know, one of our staffs uh, were able to uh, revise from the previous existing uh, implementation written by one of our former employees. Um, but you know, definitely, we'll take that into consideration, and um, you know, we'll pass that along to the team. For the moment, okay. um, just think of it as you know, this is a feature that uh, if you want to add on to your existing application, um, you know, uh, if you know, if you just happen to have already a web server license, um, that that will be uh, helpful as well. Yeah, not web services. You not the web services. Them. Web server. Okay, very good. Okay. Good question, Tim. Yeah, thanks for. Uh for uh, uh, covering those ad and for uh, all of all of the effort that your team puts forward uh, for that. Um, Ed, Edgar also mentioned in the chat that there is the, uh, uh, the remote admin component from Thomas Mao, um, but I believe that's not a, a web interface. That's just a, a 40 form. So it's also quite handy um, for a, a different flavor of, uh, you know, to be able to, customize the the server admin window but if nothing else it'll be interesting to uh get into the the source code in the web page and sort of see how they did their nice design graphs and whatnot um and uh yeah to steal some ideas but yeah so getting back to uh thanks ad again uh Getting back to uh, ads team and uh, and how much effort that they really put into uh, all of these tech notes and and knowledge base articles and all of their obviously all of their support of uh, us 4D users. Um, uh, we're our, our special demo today is from Eric Louis. Uh, Eric studied computer engineering at uh, San Jose State University and then in. 2018, he joined 4D as a technical service engineer. Uh, he enjoys games and competition, uh, and I assume he's interested in, uh, in in preparing to watch the uh, the competition that will be starting momentarily in the World Cup. Um, so mm -hmm. let's uh, let's get started, and and we, so we can all tune into the game and uh, and check out some of the great tips that uh, that Eric has. Has uh, is getting ready to share for us for switching to project mode. Hi, Eric. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks, Brent. Yeah. So just to get started, uh, I've worked on a few kind of project conversions for a few clients, and I just kind of compiled a list of things I've noticed. I know it says six, but there's seven here, so you know, mind the extra demo. <laughs> and so wait, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Sure. So. I'll stop sharing. Go ahead. Okay. So hopefully you guys can see my screen. So what you should see is on the left side there, left side is the binary, right side is the project. And then I'll just be going through each of some of the changes that I've noticed. Um, first things first, when you log in as in binary mode, in sorry, yeah, in binary, you have a simple login screen. Um, and in project mode, it's the same thing. But if you are running project mode in single user, it will always default as a designer. So quick demo here, you know, if you hop into our toolbox, we have users that have passwords. So if I do a quick restart, it should give us the login screen. If I do the same thing here, I double check, make sure you know, there's some password set. If I do a quick restart, it automatically logs in as designer, regardless of whether there's a password or not. 
And I believe this change was intended to kind of um, force the single user to always be in design mode and to kind of advocate people to use GitHub. And that's why they made that change. Um, it could lead into certain issues, right? If you made apps that are dependent on maybe like you check a current user, if a current user is this user, then you might do something else. So um, for example, like over here, I have a button that checks if I'm, um, the current user is me. And if I click it, if I'm any other user, it would just say like, you don't have permission, but if I change to myself, you know, it's, it's all good. If you do the same thing in project mode, there's an added effect of the command change current user doesn't actually do anything because you are always designer. So right now I'm designer. I don't have permission. Um, I want to change to myself and nothing actually happens. So that's like one thing you might need to be aware of if you have a lot of forms that are dependent on the current user. One way you can kind of go about it is to kind of spoof it. You can set your user alias. So if I go to maybe here, you can like set your user alias if you want to kind of um, simulate being a different user. And note that this changes only if you are in single user mode. If you're running project mode in client server, it works exactly the same as binary. So if I run the same thing again, and right now I, I should be alias Eric, it should be working. So that's one thing to be aware of if you have a lot of like custom login screens and um, current user checks in your forms. Yeah, there's there's also the um, where the uh, the user list file is stored uh, is also a, a quick tip of, uh, you know, that should be moved over to where the data file is, right? Yeah, you could do that. So that kind of jumps into the second point of um, clients that have custom login screens that usually save users to blob. So typically when you call this command, Oh, because right now I'm logged in as Eric, so let me just switch back to designer. Typically, when you call this command, you should get a blob of all the users. And you can tell that here we have 69 octets, so there's something in it. We do the same thing in project mode. It actually does not, it will return a blank blob because the users are no longer stored in the structure. They're stored in a separate local file on disk called a directory.json's. But if you were to do the same thing here, you know, nothing will actually happen. So I came across some clients that have that custom login screen. And whenever they updated their structure, they would save it into like a table. But whenever they saved it in the table, it would just be zero blob. And then the problem was the next time they called the other um, blob to users, well, the blob is empty. So the blob to users doesn't actually do anything. So instead, if you ever wanted to access your users in project mode, there's a file on local disk. So you can do like a document to JSON. And then you can parse it. And the good thing is it's an object. So it's, you know, you can read what's actually in it compared to a blob. And you can do whatever you want with it. You can store that as an object in a table. If you need to save your users, you can convert to blob. So I'll leave that up to the developers. And for the third point, is another change in the structure. So picture library or uh, the lack thereof in project mode. So typically, if you have any commands that call something like read picture from library, you know, you can read it pretty easily. That's just how it works. In project mode, well, there is no longer a library. Note that it, it is grayed out. So if you have any commands that refer to the picture library, you might get like an error. Or you, know, you might not get an error, but that variable, that pick variable is not, there's nothing in it. So if you try to manipulate that picture, nothing's going to, you might get a runtime error. This is only happening because I'm calling transform picture. So that might be an issue. Um, what you want to do to prevent that or to work around that is to use read picture to file. So instead of the picture library, it's now stored again locally on disk in your resources folder, most likely in the images folder. So you can just read that file directly and you can show it from there. So you do need to kind of like modify some code in your database if you do use the read picture from library command. And speaking of pictures, there's also a pretty handy feature that was nice to have in binary mode, which was the transparent option. I know some clients also use this pretty often for like static pictures. So there's this pretty nice property here. If you have a 
um, image with a white background, you can kind of toggle that alpha layer and just make it transparent. So that is no longer in project mode. So if I kind of hop back here, let's go into design mode. There's no longer that transparent option. So instead, you may have to add that transparent transparent layer yourself using transform picture, which you just pass in the variable, you force the transparency option, and you apply it to a white background. And it looks something like this. If you have a static picture, you might have to maybe apply that transparent layer and then save that as a new picture and then import that back as a static picture. So that's something to note of if you're dealing with a lot of pictures with the transparency. And for the fifth change, there are radio buttons. So this might not apply to a lot of databases, but if you're like a OG 40 developer that came from 2003, um, you might have radio buttons that have a property that can be grouped by a variable name. So if I hop into the form here, so here I named it like B1, B2, B3, B4, but they're not actually grouped by like the grouping tool, but they can still work. So this was the option that was in 2003. And if you convert it through all the way then, you might still have that option toggled. Um, how you can check is you go to your settings and compatibility, and there should be a checkbox that says, you know, ready buttons grouped by name. So this is forced off due to compatibility reasons and project mode. So if you notice that your radio buttons aren't functioning correctly. So right here, you know, is this not really working? It's because that option was forced um, off. Instead, ideally, you do want to group them by the grouping tool. So just do a simple group here. And not only that, you do need to give it a group name. So I'm just going to call it test. And now the radio buttons work as intended. So that's something to note of if you come from a very old database back in 2003. I didn't know that there was a, a group name. It's not named by default or anything. Yeah, it's just as long as the, I think your variable name has the same like prefix. So right, it was like B1, B2, B3, B4. It would treat it all as the same group. Right, but the um the the, the ability to name a group in uh, project mode, I hadn't yeah. seen that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a pretty good gotcha moment, too, because if you actually group it and you don't name it, I think it still kind of doesn't function properly. Ah, yeah, I hadn't seen that before. And another uh, tricky thing is sometimes if you have a, a large application is uh, uh, finding all of the radio buttons to make sure that um, that they're grouped appropriately once you switch to project mode and you know, you can always code a little, um, a little something to analyze the uh, the the JSON form files. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Uh, so I'll be diving. Types. I'll be diving into kind of like. Oh yeah, go ahead. Can uh, go you ahead. can you can you uh, manipulate that group by name, like object set visible, and specify that group name? You can do it from the JSON file because everything is stored in. Um, no, no. I mean, programmatically. Like, say you you're you're setting. Uh, you want to set a group of objects visible or invisible, and mm -hmm. in the it, you didn't pass, you would do it like have all the names of the objects start with the same value, and then you'd say you know object set visible, you know radio at symbol, and then mm -hmm. every object that began with radio would be set visible or invisible with one object set visible command. I'm just mm -hmm. wondering if you could use the group name in object set visible. Or invisible. That's a good question. I haven't tried it. Okay. So I didn't yeah. know if you knew that or not. Uh, yeah. That might be used for grouping things is to be able to just set set them. Then you wouldn't have to name everything the same. You just group a bunch of stuff together, and that one group name would take all dissimilar object names. Anyway, yeah. Uh, I'd be I'd, I'd be worried if there's like a form that has like multiple sets of radio buttons because you don't want to group all of them to the same group. So there's like some kind of tinkering with that, but. If there's only like one set of group of radio buttons performed, then that would probably work. But yeah, I'll look into that one. Yeah, Ad mentioned that the uh, the group name is uh, is new and specifically for radio buttons. Yeah, uh, apparently. Yeah. So if you go back and take a look at the property on the property list, 
for the project model? Yeah. You see, as it's listed under um, um, uh, object, uh, a radio group, that's the name. If you look up above, there's an object name. That that object name, you can use it to do, um, um, you know, object manipulation, like set visible and stuff like that. Not, okay, the, radio, not the radio mm -hmm. group name, okay? I, I it's see. used okay. for a different purpose. Okay, so it, so it is possible. Use it, but you don't use that. We don't use that. You use the one above. Yeah, okay. Okay, that's good to know. Thanks, Sam. And so for the sixth change was holly buttons. And this is pretty big because my first project conversion had a I had a client who had like thousands of holly buttons. And actually before I dive into that, let's see if, you know what it does. So typically when you have a holly button and you click on it, there is a um kind of highlight saying like you clicked on it. And it's nice because you can enable disable and there's a pretty good user. Um, interface like you can tell when it's disabled and when you clicked on it when you convert to project mode all the high buttons are now converted into regular buttons and there's an issue where there's kind of a lack of ui so when i click on it you know there's no like highlight if i enable if i disable you actually it's actually disabled but you actually can't tell because there's no indication so ideally we want it to um for this customer to change like thousands of buttons manually, that was a very, it was not very practical to do it by hand. Instead, you can actually parse through, again, like how Brent said, whenever you go through any conversion, there's always a conversion JSON file that will kind of show you what actually has changed. So you can make a method that can search through all the high button warnings. So in this case, we have like three of them from three different forms. And it, tells you exactly which form and which object. And so basically this method will go through this log file, find exactly where the objects are, put it in a collection, for loops it, and then we convert it into a custom button that has like a two state SVG just to show some kind of UI um, indication whenever it's clicked and disabled. So I'm gonna click on this button here. And here we got just like the log file. So let's go back here so now it's like parsing through all the forms all the forms have been updated and then upon the next um the ne next time you open that form it should apply those changes now when i click on it it's it's basically like you're spoofing a highlight button in project mode and now you have a nice little disable indication so you could probably do something similar with um, radio buttons if you didn't want to like go through all the forms and find them manually you could you could parse it through the logs file and search it yourself. Or... And so, and so that's making a, a three or more state uh, a picture for the standard rollover picture button effect. Yeah, it's a custom button with the two state um, background SVG, which cool. gets created in, in the method itself. So I sh can actually, before I do that, let me actually put that in the. I'll put that in the chat if you guys wanted to use it. Yeah, no, that's uh, I'm sure that's handy, especially if you have thousands of highlight buttons. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I'll put that near the end. I don't think I can see the chat with the screen share, but actually, oh, here it is. Yeah, so there's a method in the chat. Um, all you have to pass in is your conversion log file, and if you have any highlight buttons, it will handle all of that. And mm -hmm. just to just to prove it, I also have like some table input output forms. That also have like a highlight button just to make sure that that method actually changes this one as well we do get that ui indication here and if you go back to maybe table two yeah so all the highlight buttons do get changed back to um or the method applies that change to all the previously set highlight buttons which are now custom buttons so that one's really useful and for the last change is more of a change between client servers. So there's lists and a lot of people use list for any drop-down menu or if you have a list box that has like a list property into it. So one of the big changes is that whenever you're running project mode in client server, if you're a 19.0 or 19R5 19 or older, um, clients are read-only, which means that any changes that you try to write, let's say for a list, actually won't update your list. So I do have to demo this in client server mode. So 
I have a back in the background that's running R6 server. So let me actually connect to that remotely with R6. Here. And there's actually, so let's actually show the issue first. So let me do, go here. Yeah, so first thing you should notice that everything is in read only based on some of the titles of these forms. And let's see what happens, right? So typically when you have a list, you know, notice that this, this goes all the way to test 14. When I click on this plus button, it's gonna update the list in the structure and then refresh this list. And just to make sure it's shown in the, in here there's test 14, that's good. So if I click on plus, we should see test 15 and our structure does have that updated item. Now, because we're read only and save list doesn't actually do anything, you might come across the issue where you try to update the list and nothing actually gets updated. So test 17, it doesn't really matter. Save list does not work in project mode, client server mode. Assuming you're in 19.r and 19.r because they recently added something in 19R6 where it, you can connect to um, project mode server in development mode, which basically works the same way as client server binary mode where you can actually modify code. So if I do, let's just connect to that again. If it was six, nine. There is a handy feature where you can activate development mode. And in order to do that, the clients do need access to that project source file. So if we navigate to that real quickly here, there was an error. Okay. And you were just navigating to the uh, project file? Uh, yeah, there? yeah, yeah, yeah. You need to navigate to the project file in order for the client to be able to have right access. Ah, okay. So here we are actually calling save list and test 17, let's click it and test 18. So that does get updated. So that's one solution if you're doing with lists. The other solution, if you, let's say, you know, you're not confident, you want to use 19R6, you want to stick with the dot release. Um, well, I would recommend, oh yeah, go ahead. And, and, and that would only work if you are um, uh, not compiled, right? You're in development mode. Yeah, development mode. Right. Yeah, if you're in compiled, right. you may have to do a different solution, which is right. saving your list to a blob and writing that to a table instead. Basically, to not use the the list.json file that gets generated. So, the second the second drop down menu here actually does that. So whenever I click the plus button, actually before anything even happens, is the, the list gets loaded, right? So the first thing that happens is it checks that list table to see if there's any any list in that table. So right now I have one record and the list name is called test. So if test is in this list table, then load the blob. Um, I think you call it blob to list, and then you load that into the variable into your dropdown item here. So that's the first thing that happened. When I click plus, it will save the new it will append the item to the list and then it will save it as a blob and then save that within the table so here is test 19 hit plus and it work let's see we're still here Let me do a quick let me reopen this real quick. There was a um a quick little question in the uh, chat uh, from Mark uh, about uh, the saving of the list in compiled mode being a significant change. Um, and if there was something about it written up in uh, in the tech notes, um, I believe there is a tech note. Yeah, uh, I did actually write a tech note on that. Yeah, about heading list. 
Um, but it's really just those two commands. You do want to save your blobs, your list of blobs, and then save that in the table. And whenever you load it, you want to just do a query to the table and then load the blob back into a list. And let me see if I can find that in the text up here. And in this project mode. Okay, here we go. Yeah, and I just got it. So that's kind of the way to deal with list if you're dealing with project mode compile. Um, this was probably the biggest change I found because there's, you know, lists are very useful. And to kind of like rewrite code for project mode is a pretty big, uh, it's a pretty big task. So ultimately, it will depend on your use case whether or not project mode is worth it for you. I think if you if you believe that GitHub and using classes is far more beneficial than you know rewriting some of the code for list and some of the other changes here, then yeah, I think that'd be worth it for you. Otherwise, if you don't use GitHub and you're not really using classes, I think it's perfectly fine to use binary for now. Especially for me, um, I do a lot of testing. So I guess this isn't on the list, but um I do like being able to create input output forms really, really quickly. So like just having a table and just go into the new table and create, like this is really useful for me because I do a lot of tech cases with sample databases. Um, for project mode, the input output forms aren't automatic. So if you were to create like a new table and you try to access it, it's like, darn, I got to to create these input output forms like manually so that's like the not fun part for me so it's going to depend on your database because every database is going to be different but hopefully this kind of dives into some of the things that you might encounter and it might make things easier for you yeah no, that's that's great it's uh it's it's wonderful to be able to have uh some a advanced notice about uh, some of these these issues instead of finding out about you know thousands of highlight buttons that need to be changed after the fact. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was the guinea pig. <laughs> um, will you be making this uh, this yeah. database uh, available? Yeah, let me go ahead and zip those two, and then let me put that in the chat. Yeah. Um, was there any other questions? Uh, Ad did add the uh, uh, the the tech note uh, to the chat there, but it's called managing lists in project mode. That can be found in the knowledge base. Um, that's uh, definitely an interesting one. Uh, I I've recently seen a uh, ran in, ran into an, an issue with the list code not being preemptive too. So. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, watch out about trying to um, get too happy about preemptive code and, and data classes and adding a uh, to save list to blob and that kind of thing. Yeah, in <laughs> in, uh, in your preemptive code because it's not gonna work. Um, awesome. So I just posted the sample databases. Um, there's two folders: one for the binary, one for project, and it should be in the chat. Great. Um, Yep, I'll, uh, uh, let's see, I think that got sent directly to me, but there we go. And I'll also add that uh, Dropbox link to uh, the 40 method post uh, so that people can have that. Um, yeah, well, thanks, Eric. That was, that was uh, I think we're, we set a time record on that. That was, that was a quick one. <laughs> awesome. <Yeah. laughs> Well, that's good. No, but it, 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 none, nonetheless, it was uh, valuable tips. And again, we appreciate all of the uh, the great work that you guys do over there and uh, on ads team and at 4D to, um, <laughs> yeah, to uh, no, no uh, share the information and, and whatnot. Um, and as Edgar said, uh, this was a model for future presentations. <laughs> I was, I was just getting used to the two and a half hour apparatus presentation. <laughs> I don't know how to handle something this so. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's uh, yeah, so um, well, thanks, Eric, and uh, just gonna gonna power through. Uh, if there's any other questions, now's the time to to reach out and ask or to uh, email uh. The, tech services at, at 4D there uh, for any of your questions for switching to project mode. 
or just ask on the forum. There's a lot of uh, people out there that would love to uh, help you out. Um, again, our, our schedule is at 40method.com slash schedule. And uh, we've got the, these open dates here, February 1st, March 22nd, May 10th. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, if you're ready to, 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 to get the, the 40 Method Spotlight, uh, let us know and we'll get you on the schedule. Um, uh, other than that, uh, thanks so much to, again, to everyone uh, who participates in these meetings and uh, everyone at 4D who uh, helps to uh, share news and, uh, and, and, and make this kind of content available for everyone. Uh, feedback is always appreciated, uh, as well as uh, support on our Patreon at patreon.com slash 40 method. Um, beyond that, let's all go watch some soccer. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Brent. All right. Thank you, guys. We'll see thank you, you next time. We'll see you next time. Thanks, everyone. All right. See everyone. Thank you. Bye. Bye.